Punk here, or good afternoon uh, to the East Coast. Uh, we're here in uh, California. Um, welcome to uh, the presentation on internal controls, a new FCPA enforcement risk. Um, as always, uh, two things. One, uh, if you want a copy of the slides afterwards, I'm happy to send them to you. Just send me an email, and I'll send you a set of the slides. Uh, I will also post this on the uh, YouTube channel uh, as well, uh, so that if uh, you want to listen to it later or um, have somebody else listen to it, that's fine. Um, in addition, if you do have any questions or comments as we're going along, please uh, feel free to post them. Obviously, technical problems, let me know, and I'll try to fix those as fast as I can. Uh, and that should be it. Um, and I'll try to get to the questions. If I don't get to your question, um, uh, I'll probably write you after the uh, webinar is over, just to follow up uh, so we can go through that. Um, today's uh, session is one that I've wanted to do for a while. Um, I think that uh, this next year is going to be very interesting in FCPA enforcement. Um, and I think we should all sort of be mindful uh, that in uh, and, and sort of, you know, reading the tea leaves or whatever you want to call it, um, frankly, I think that uh, I would expect this year to see some important prosecutions that are based solely on books and records and internal controls enforcement uh, or provisions. And, we'll, and I'll explain to you my theory on this. Uh, it is not that uh, this is going to be extraordinary, I think, because uh, it's going to be situations where there's insufficient evidence to establish bribery, but nonetheless, uh, it'll be an FDPA-type prosecution for internal controls uh, violations. So I think DOJ and the SEC uh, have, you know, want to stretch their enforcement limits and theories just to capture certain cases where it's difficult for them to establish bribery. Uh, they've done it before, uh, but I think they're become setting it up to do it even more so. So we're going to see more of a focus on books and records and internal controls. Uh, you know, the old motto amongst, amongst the FDPA bar, like myself, is look, if they, can't, if they can't find bribery, even though they suspect it, they're always going to get a company on books and records and internal controls. And that's what I think we're seeing, but more importantly is the really important part here is that DOJ is getting more interested in this theory, and that means criminal prosecutions. Criminal prosecutions for books and records and internal controls without evidence of bribery. That is the really significant, there's one message I want to send to you, that is significant. Uh, a little bit more background here, we're also uh, transitioning this year, uh, or companies already should have transitioned, really, uh, to the, the COSO framework, the new COSO framework. The old one was 1992. We're up to 2013 uh, COSO framework, uh, and we're going to talk about that. So the potential for enforcement actions becomes even more complicated now that we have a new COSO framework, and in the years to come, it's going to become even more significant, uh, in my view, because of the COSO framework. So. Um, this is where I see the potential for enforcement actions uh, going. So this is sort of just a, a summary of what we're going to talk about. Let's talk first about books and records. Um, books and records. We always hear books and records, books and records. And uh, as always, I like to go to the law. And a lot of this law is mumbo jumbo in the sense of we've seen it so many times. It's so generalized. But I'm going to try to give you a little bit more uh, flavor for it. Books and records is basically, and I don't use the term issue, uh, um, issuance, issuers, um, but basically the internal accounting controls consist of two sets of uh, two statutory requirements. One is books and records, and the second is internal controls. So a public company has to maintain books, records, and accounts that in reasonable detail, and that was a a, you know, sort of political compromise, accurately and fairly reflect an issuer's transactions and dispositions of assets. So, and what does reasonable detail mean? It means the level of detail that would satisfy prudent officials in the conduct of their own affairs, meaning 
it's got to be reasonable. Okay, folks, we know what's unreasonable when we look at something. So what they're trying, and obviously this was the provision, and I've been writing about this on the blog as well to coincide with this webinar. This is what Judge Stanley Sporkin, the, the father or grandfather, a uh, good friend of mine of the FCPA, viewed as the most important part of the FCPA. There was no part, there was basically no prohibition on false reporting in public company books. So he put this in and he thought that this would stop bribery because nobody's going to write down bribery as uh, a bribery expense. Uh, so it prohibits the mischaracterization of a transaction. Like bribery, like the anti-bribery provision, however, it can relate to any amount of money. Uh, any amount of money, okay? Um, all of these provisions, by the way, are in 15 U.S.C. 77, Section 77, 15 United States Code 77. Um, so here, there's no materiality requirement. It could be a $5 mischaracterization. It could be a $3 mischaracterization. It doesn't matter. Just like you can have, there's no materiality threshold for bribery. You can have, as a matter of fact, in the facts of a recent case, there was a mention of a bribe going as low as $4. So there's no materiality requirement. Your books and records and your accounts have to be accurate with regard to transactions, you know, buying things, selling things, uh, or you know, transferring things within a company or dispositions of assets, sales of assets, okay? So 15 U.S.C. Section 77 is where you see, uh, where you start to see the 77F, F, I believe, is the, uh, the specific requirement. Now, separate from the books and records requirement is a requirement, a more generalized requirement, and to me very general, internal controls. A public company has to maintain a system of internal accounting control. Now, look, the thinking behind this was to make sure that the financial reporting and financial disclosures that are made are accurate, okay? And that there's a, a system for making sure that, 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 it, uh, that the financial reports that are coming out from a public company are accurate, that there's no sort of a, you know, hanky-panky going on in that sense. But there's much more to internal controls than that. And I'll, I'll show you the areas where they're, they're, they're reflected. The fact is that you can have internal controls that not only address your accounting controls sufficient to assure management control, authority, and responsibility over the firm's assets, but it consists of five important elements, okay? This comes from the 1992 COSO, and it comes from the, 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 uh, the notion, it's not from uh, the statute or anything like that. Companies are given uh, a lot of discretion to come up with a set of internal controls. But when you look at it, um, when you look at it with regard to internal controls, there are five important elements, okay? So that number one are, is a control environment that covers the tone set by the organization regarding integrity and ethics. Now this, everybody says this is tone at the top. It is tone at the top, but I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about that. It means that there is a risk assessment, a risk assessment not only in a financial sense, uh, in financial reporting or financial activities, but extending to compliance programs because a compliance program is a part of a company's internal controls. An ethics and compliance program is part of a company's internal controls. That's a very important fact. So risk assessment. Third is control activities that cover policies and procedures designed to ensure that management directives are carried out. So, for example, in the financial controls area, that would mean that you would have to have some system within, some reasonable system designed to your uh, specific risks and your company's operations where there are approval requirements and, let's say, approval of various transactions at certain levels, certain kinds. 
authorizations. How much money can I, as an officer or an employee, authorize my company to spend on the basis of my signature? Reconciliations, uh, obviously, is to make sure that the books are reconciled and make sure that the transactions are reconciled so that you are actually getting what you pay for or that you actually uh, um, uh, receive the money for your services or product. And interestingly, segregation of duties, which is a very important concept for reducing fraud risk and, and it, any other type of this kind of financial misconduct. So then we have that there has to be a system of information and communication, information and communication meaning reporting lines coming up with information, communication up and down the company, and obviously monitoring as the last, uh, the last piece. Um, uh, so since there, uh, this is an interesting question that came in, uh, since there is no materiality requirement, are publicly traded, uh, publicly traded companies required to disclose every violation through an 8K or 10Q? That's a good question, and the answer is no. Um, if there, for example, are transactions that are mischaracterized on the books and records, and I've even seen situations where companies have more than that with bribery violations going along with that, that uh, in those situations, the question is whether or not it's material for purposes of 8K or 10Q. Um, and that goes, the materiality determination goes to, I think, the overall operation of the company, the risk that could come from an FCPA uh, violation, the risk that could come or would it have a material effect on the company, uh, and things like that. So that's a very good question and a, and a good uh, way to think about it. Uh, that materiality is a different concept for AQ and 10K reporting purposes, uh, AK and 10Q, sorry about that. And it also is different for uh, purposes of books and records uh, in terms of a, a potential violation. Now, the reach of the accounting uh, provisions are very is also important. Um, and the accounting provisions were enacted, as I said, part of the FCPA, but they also apply to a, a huge range of non-FCPA violations. In other words, a failure to disclose. In other words, a failure to disclose, to disclose something. Uh, is, uh, in your uh, company's operations and fraud. Uh, fraud in terms of fraudulent accounting reporting, uh, things like that. Um, so, uh, so, oh, so uh, the, you have to realize that these provisions uh, apply to much more than just the FCPA. Now, applying to issuers, and we've all heard this, but the issuers are obviously public companies, companies that file reports with the SEC, OTC companies that are required to file SEC reports, and foreign companies trading in American depository receipts. The last point uh, that I think is very important is that it extends to foreign subsidiaries and joint venture operations where the company has control. So, for example, if your company has a subsidiary operating in Germany, and that company can either be subject to the internal controls of the United States headquarters company, or in some cases, and you'll see it actually led to some problems, in one case we're going to talk about, is that it uh, the, uh, the subsidiary can have an obligation to put in their own internal controls. And obviously, they have to comply with the books and records. But all of this is rolled up, as you know, foreign subsidiaries, foreign joint venture operations are all rolled up into your consolidated financial reports. So these internal controls requirements extend to foreign subsidiaries and joint venture operations where the company has control. Where companies in a joint venture and they have less than control, 49, 48, 47 percent, you're required to make your best efforts in terms of books and records and in terms of internal controls. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about the exact two provisions that are important. The first, uh, probably the, note, the most important, uh, two two provisions 
um, uh, the Exchange Act rule, which is 13B 2.2-1 provides, and this is in 15 U.S.C. 77 as well, uh, no person shall directly or indirectly falsify or cause to be falsified any book, record, or account subject to the books and records provision. That is very important, obviously, for FCPA purposes. But the real important one that I'm looking at is the one below this, and which may be the important part of a criminal prosecution. No person shall knowingly circumvent, and that is very important circumvent or knowingly fail to implement a system of internal accounting controls or knowingly falsify any book record or account. So Section 13b-5 is really the kicker when it comes down to potential criminal prosecutions, okay? Um, going back to the books and records count, there was an interesting comment that is uh, the new trend on books and records uh, is that it reflects uh, in the auditors and CPA, you know, when your auditors come in and look through the books, uh, even that's why they check even the smallest amounts. Now, usually, um, some external auditors are hyper focused on materiality uh, in terms of expenditures and checking things, but now they're becoming a little bit more focused on non material transactions because of books and records. Uh, and because uh, people are recognizing that they're missing things when it comes to bribery, and there's a lot of pressure on the auditors to go below the materiality threshold because they are missing potential bribes that could occur, you know, for ten, twenty, a hundred dollars, or we've seen them occur at a petty cash fund. So that's a, a very important comment uh, that you got to make. So those are your liability provisions and there's your criminal liability and and I should have clarified this when I was talking before uh, and there's an oddity in the statute but the, uh, you know uh, the Chamber of Commerce politically tried to use this later on uh, or you know later on in a few years ago when they were trying to go around and say corporations are treated unfairly under the FCPA and frankly it's uh, I never was very persuaded by any of their arguments uh, frankly the Chamber went about this the wrong way the criminal penalties uh, for violation of the books and records or internal controls, and individually, individual who willfully, and willfully is added in for criminal purposes, and knowingly violates the book and books and records or internal controls. Now, violating internal controls can be circumventing your, your internal controls. Circumventing, in my mind, and I'm sure DOJ thinks of it, is not following, not following your internal controls. Uh, is subject to 20 years imprisonment or a five-year and or five million dollar fine. Now, in practice, willfully doesn't mean, mean that much. What the, the government looks at is, did you know about the controls, okay? In other words, and there are many companies that require people to certify that they're aware of certain controls. And uh, did you violate them? Did you circumvent them? Did you not follow them? Not follow them is what I'm looking at. And companies which knowingly violate the books and records or internal control provision uh, are subject to a $25 million fine. So those are the, that's sort of how this all lays out in terms of liability and, and what happens. I want to talk a little bit, so I, I, that's the law, and I want to talk a little bit more about what are required uh, as part of internal controls. Internal controls, as I said before, subsumes within it the concept of an ethics and compliance program because there obviously are financial systems that are in place with policies and procedures. So we have ethics and integrity or tone at the top. We have risk assessments, and I've talked about that. But we have to have a financial system with policies and procedures to make sure that payments are done consistent with authorizations and approvals based on company approvals. And those can be tiered based upon authority, risk mitigation, third-party agents, for example, looking at invoices. But, for example, people have certain levels of authority uh, based uh, you know, authorizations to spend certain money based upon their job. If they're the global manager for something, then they may have uh, authorization to spend a greater amount of money than if I'm a managing a plant in Indiana. 
uh, the reconciliation of accounts and associated process, and we talked about segregation of duties, which is you want to have, you want to uh, reduce uh, the risk of theft or embezzlement by making sure that uh, no one person has access to money through their own devices. In other words, that you could have three people that are needed to approve a particular expenditure and you want to segregate the duties to reduce the fraud, uh, the risk of fraud. Controls obviously have to be documented. Uh, that's the way the company operates. They have a set of controls, they're documented, their policies, they're put in place. They depend upon information sharing within and across the function and communications. They all, the monitoring activities is to make sure that people comply with that. So we have monitoring and we have auditing. Monitoring includes auditing in this sense. And so we have monitoring and auditing uh, activities to go along with that. So an effective compliance program is a critical component of a company's internal controls. And I'm going to show you in uh, uh, one of the most important, I think, uh, enforcement actions, uh, the company was found, uh, FCPA, the company's uh, compliance program was found to be inadequate, which in turn, the, the government made a finding that the, the company's internal controls were deficient. So that's why I'm saying we've got to have an effective compliance program as a critical component of the company's internal controls. And the company's internal controls have to take into account the how the company operates and what are the risks. So what are your products or services? How do you get them to the market? Obviously, if you use third-party agents, if you use distributors, that's going to be something. What's the nature of your workforce? Is it overseas? Most of it is overseas. Are they going to be familiar with anti-corruption uh, requirements in the United States? That type of thing. How much regulation, any government interaction do you have? These are all concepts we're very familiar with. And how much are we operating in high-risk corruption? Uh, countries, you know, high-risk uh, countries. So we have to tailor our compliance program to these factors. This is all basic as part of a risk assessment. A company operating in a high-risk corruption market is going to have obviously different uh, uh, internal controls than those that operate in low-risk. Um, and at a minimum, you have to have policies and procedures and, uh, that address bribery, gifts, hospitality, entertainment and expenses, customer travel, political contributions, charitable donations, facilitation payments, extortion and solicitation, and more. I mean, frankly, this is the basic requirement that comes from Schedule C of the uh, DOJ and F FEC settlements uh, that have been going on uh, in the FCPA. So the interesting issue now is the uh, DOJ and the FCC, they have a long record of dual enforcement, what I call dual enforcement. In other words, where the facts establish that there was, that bribes were paid, the fact that people plead guilty to or settle to violations of the internal controls and books and records uh, provisions is of no moment. That's been going on for, you know, years. Uh, sometimes companies want to plead guilty and settle to a books and records violation than saying they were bribed, you know, they committed bribery. Um, uh, it, it, it makes really no difference other than it's sort of the atmospherics of that. To me, the interesting issue is do they have a factual basis for bribery, to allege bribery? And what I am concerned about and what I see happening right now, and I think we all have to watch this, is FCPA enforcement for accounting control violations where there was no direct evidence of bribery, but the government just says we think there's a risk that bribery could occur, may occur uh, in that situation. So think about it, though. How do you get your proof? How does the government get its proof of bribery? The way they get their proof of bribery is usually from voluntary disclosures, internal investigation, and people admitting it. Uh, Judge Sporkin, when he created the FCPA and came up with the idea, resisted the idea from the various senators to include a bribery prohibition because he thought it's hard to prove. It is hard to prove. Look at it almost in the domestic context. Bribery is hard to prove. Illegal gratuities is easier to prove. 
bribery requires a quid pro quo. It's often done in secret. There are only two people. You can figure, you can corroborate what somebody says through the movement of money uh, or things like that, but it's hard to prove bribery. So for that reason, um, uh, what, what the, the basic way that the Justice Department and the SEC have been proving it is people admitting it or internal investigations getting admissions themselves. Uh, and they, internal investigators, the law firm that comes in, interviews the executive, and the executive or the manager eventually says, yeah, I, I did all the bribes, I gave him this much money, and he gave me this in exchange for that. So, and bribery payments uh, are mischaracterized on the books and records. Nobody writes down bribery. Uh, and obviously, there's a circumvention of internal control policy. They got to get money uh, to pay the bribes. And you have to either use your third parties to do it inappropriately, or you take out large money, uh, amount of money for gifts, meals, and entertainment. Those are ways that policies are circumvented with regard to uh, supporting the bribery. So let's look at some of the more important cases and the precedent that's out there and what I, and what I see as a real uh, risk in this area. And one of the most uh, troublesome cases from my point of view is the Oracle case. And uh, I've written about this, but I really think uh, if you're looking at risks in this area, this is probably the most important case to look at because it's being used as a precedent uh, there are several investigations that are ongoing right now that are stalling, and they're stalling on the issue of whether or not there is proof of bribery. And, and what uh, people are hearing from the Justice Department and the SEC is, okay, we don't have enough proof of bribery, but we can show that you didn't follow your internal controls. We can show that you moved money around and didn't accurately report it on your, uh, on your books and records or something like that. Um, it's usually not following in, uh, internal controls or creating risks of bribery. So the SEC in 2012, after a long investigation against uh, Oracle, uh, ultimately settled for around $2 million in this was in 2012, and the conduct at issue related to 2005 to 2007, where there were a number of transactions involving sales of the Oracle products to the Indian government. Um, and the Oracle distributors who were part of these transactions um, were, uh, there was about $2.2 million that was generated uh, and held through these transactions, in other words, profits or whatever, or payments that had to go back. The Oracle distributors held on to the money, and then they sort of uh, moved the money out off their books, in a sense, to unauthorized vendors and storefronts, people, you know, shady characters, in a sense, vendors that uh, had not gone through the vendor procurement system, and these people were holding the money for them. They weren't going out and spending it. They weren't doing anything. If anything, they could establish that the money was still there. The money itself, the $2.2 million, was not reported in Oracle's consolidated reports. Uh, so there obviously was a books and records problem, and there were violations of the internal accounting controls. There was no evidence absolutely no evidence that any of that money was used or generated from bribery activity relating to the sales of these uh, Oracle products to the Indian government. But in this case, the government cited that these, there was an increased risk that these funds could be used for bribery. And that's my concern. This is an incredible precedent. And in a sense, it gives the government a way to sort of salvage a case out of a situation where they don't find bribery. Now, where there's a risk that funds could be used for bribery, I mean, there's always a risk uh, that all funds can be used, but what was unique about this was that the, this money was already off the books. This money was sort of sitting somewhere off the books and could have been very easily used because there were no controls surrounding the, the money at that point. They were already sitting in the vendors and the storefronts and the buddies' uh, um, accounts. So that was the real danger of the Oracle case 
uh, and it's and it sets a very dangerous precedent, and people are very worried about it because now it's it's sort of coming back to resuscitate what I would call these new uh, these stalled investigations. Um, so, uh, anyways, uh, so uh, there's a problem with regard to, uh, to this and how it's going to be. Interestingly, there was an individual case. An SEC uh, prosecuted an individual by the name of Thomas Bristol, uh, who was working at a company uh, that was basically involved in a project, uh, and he was the uh, he was the head of the company or the subsidiary, and uh, or a senior executive. I'm sorry, president. Uh, and he was. Uh, um, they were involved in a building a an Air Force military uh, depot, an aircraft depot uh, for the Egyptian Air Force. So, uh, in a, what happened in this case was Wurzel, they were not able to prove bribery. They didn't say for sure bribery happened. They suggested it, but they didn't have enough proof to prove bribery, even to meet a civil standard here on the, for the evidence, not beyond the reasonable doubt. But but even to meet a civil standard. So what they looked at in this case was they took uh, a third-party agent, and he basically, Wurzel authorized uh, several payments um, through the third party to the third-party agent uh, for services related to um, getting this contract and securing this contract. So the agent himself had never gone through due diligence, and Wurzel knew that. And Wurzel never got documentation of any services that the agent provided. But Wurzel nonetheless passed this money on. The agent had contacts with the Egyptian Air Force officials, uh, and that's why he was hired. Uh, but nonetheless, he, in this situation, um, in this situation, uh, there was no evidence of actual bribery, although there was a suggestion of it. But note, all that happened was the individual here circumvented, okay, circumvented the internal control of a due diligence process, an internal control requiring documentation of services. And these are documents or documented internal controls that were not followed. Wurzel himself was cited for circumventing or not following these. Uh, these requirements, and in the end, he paid a $35,000 settlement. This, to me, again, shows you how you can go after individuals who are in a position to authorize payments uh, and nonetheless, uh, nonetheless do not follow internal procedures that are required. Failing to follow due diligence, I mean, look, let's think about that. I know companies, uh, if you get 100% uh, cooperation on following due diligence practices in all of your companies, in any global company, you're doing not just well, you're doing incredibly well. Most, there are always situations where people enter into contracts with third parties without going through due diligence. It just happens occasionally to be out there, uh, and you usually find out about it, and then there's usually an attempt to, you know, remind everybody they got to go through due diligence. Here, Wurzel knew about the policy and knew that the agent had not gone through it. So these are the types of things that can start to create liability, obviously did in this case, and um, can be used as a fail-safe for other types of investigation. Now, the Smith & Wesson case in, from last year uh, is somewhat important, not as, as important as the BioRat case, which I'm going to talk about uh, after this. But the Smith & Wesson case uh, is interesting in several respects. So you know, it's a relatively small company, even though we all know the brand. Um, and Smith & Wesson paid $2.1 million settlement with the uh, SEC and DOJ declined. And the, the real problem that was cited was the lack of internal controls for overseas sales operations. And what happened is Smith & Wesson made a commitment and they're going to go into the international marketplace, they're going to sell their gun lease, to, you know, uh, law enforcement, the military, um, and there were some actual bribery payments made in the form of guns, you know, uh, providing sample guns to people and things like that. There was, uh, you know, there were attempts and authorized 
uh, attempts to bribe, uh, although they didn't call it that, but to, to market to various companies. And there were, uh, you know, a minimal uh, actual payments uh, occurred uh, in, the, in that situation. Now, look, if you look at this laundry list here, there was no risk assessment done before they went to with, the, with regard to corruption issues. There was no due diligence done of any third parties. They used third parties to funnel a lot of these gifts and, and bribes. Uh, there were no policies and procedures for commission payments. Use of samples were being done for tests and evaluation, you know, that, whether it's gifts or commission advances. They had no policies or procedures put in place at all with regard to their international efforts. Uh, the VP of international sales was given almost carte blanche with regard to financial authority and setting up this entire regime. Uh, they faulted the, gov the government, faulted Smith and Wesson for that, meaning that the internal controls here, how the VP of international sales would have to get approvals and authorizations were basically almost non-existent. And there was no training, uh, and there was uh, uh, very little supervision of these activities. The point that was made by the government here was, look, this was a complete, it was a, it was a, it was a huge effort made by Smith & Wesson, a business effort, and, there, and going into high-risk areas, they went into Pakistan, they went into other uh, countries, was incredibly risky, and there were no attempts to design controls, no to, attempts to sort of look at compliance, nothing. So the inadequacy here, the violation occurred because there was an inadequate compliance program, uh, and that's and, and that sort of got masked in the language of internal controls for overseas sales operations. But this again shows you. Now, it, there were some actual bri bribery payments made. They were relatively small, but there was a lot that was authorized, and there was a lot that was that they thought about doing and wanted to do, but didn't do. They didn't accomplish it. And even when they did make the payments or made the promises, they never got the contracts they were supposed to get. They only got one small contract. So Smith and Wesson is sort of consistent with this line, um, but it's not as a, it, it's not as you know sort of uh, as similar to Wurzel and Oracle because you did have some indication of progress. But the focus on internal controls, nonetheless, in the compliance program is what was important. This, uh, the BioRad case is really instructive. And people, I, I would urge you to read it and just to go through it again. I, I've tried to highlight some of the big points. And it's amazing that a case that is really a non-prosecution agreement, a non-prosecution agreement, could become so significant. DOJ entered into a non-prosecution agreement. They got a $14 million penalty. And the factual statement that DOJ attached to its non-prosecution agreement had to do only with one of three countries where BioRab was fought. One was Russia, where no bribe, if you read the facts, I mean, it's pretty clear there were bribery payments made, but they did never got approved bribery. And, and to me, what probably happened is they either couldn't get to the executives that they need to, meaning they would cooperate, or the executives just lied to them and just said, we never paid a bribe. I don't care what you show me, I didn't pay a bribe uh, in terms of the internal investigation. Nonetheless, they did not get any proof of bribery in Russia. The two other countries that were involved, Vietnam and another one, they had actual proof of bribery because they got admission. They got admission. Here they didn't get admission. So in uh, the BioRad uh, case was interesting, and the, out, the statement of facts is critical here because there's no proof of bribery in Russia. There was a Russian subsidiary set up by BioRad, but it was managed by executives uh, ultimately, who were in, uh, I believe, California, they're located in California, uh, from the headquarters. But there were also people, managers on the ground. There were like three or four people who were cited in this. Uh, BioRad Russia were set up in a way, and the subsidiaries in BioRad, they had to establish, they had the autonomy to establish their own internal controls. Uh, and BioRad really didn't. And the Russians, the Russia 
operations resisted attempts to put in internal controls because they knew if they did, they wouldn't be able to continue with the scheme that they were running. And the way they ran it, I mean, it was pretty uh, audacious, is they had, they contracted with a company that had one employee, but the employee had multiple offshore company, companies and accounts, okay? There's still, among all these organizations, was only one employee, okay? They paid commissions of 15 to 30 percent for services, not just at that one company, but all the companies could not perform. So they were paying money to multiple companies, which was based upon one employee who didn't even have the capability or the uh, expertise to perform the services that were needed. They did not conduct due diligence of the offshore company. They did conduct due diligence of the single employee company, but the due dil they didn't do any due diligence of the offshore company. The contracts with the offshore companies were completely bogus. There was no service provided. It was just a means to get money. It was uh, signed by lower level bio rad managers. One, and in one case, they pointed out that the manager prepared the invoice uh, and, uh, for the company. Um, and they, it had, the contract had to be executed by lower level bio rad managers because it could not get signed by any higher level person. The managers also structured the payments under these invoices to avoid the financial approval requirements in the company. So, for example, they structured them as $200,000 payments. If they went to 250000 or two twenty five, then they'd have to get a higher up approval for the uh, requirement. So they structured payments to get around the, the, the approval requirements. There was no, uh, they, they were falsely reported. The transactions were falsely uh, reported as bad debts uh, for the commissions. Um, there was basically a finding was made that the anti-corruption compliance program at BioRad uh, Bio Russia was inadequate. Uh, it was inadequate and there were insufficient resources. They made all of these types of findings. There was no training. All policies among BioRad across the board were English-only policies. There were no due, no due diligence was conducted, no contractual provisions, and no risk assessment. So, look, it's easy to see what happened with BioRad and BioRad Russia. But notice again, they don't say, nobody in any of the facts says that there was proof of bribery, that there were all these deficiencies which make it look like bribery occurred and probably did occur, but that's nonetheless uh, the warning shot. Because very easily, these guys could have been prosecuted or the company could have been prosecuted criminally for circumventing what, in, what internal controls they had or for failing to implement and devise the system of internal controls. So that's, uh, BioRed is sort of uh, DOJ's um, you know, most important uh, situation. So now let's think about this, uh, take a step back, and where we have now uh, corporate, what I call conflicting incentives. We are required as a company to adopt and implement a robust system of internal controls. And when we get to the COSO framework, which we're going to talk about in a minute, they have to now meet uh, additional requirements. You can be prosecuted for failure to follow or circumventing the controls, either civilly or criminally. But in a sense, think about it like this. Companies are creating their own internal, and I call them statutes, for civil and criminal prosecution. So in other words, we're saying to corporate governance folks, we need to have robust internal controls, we need to monitor them, we need to audit them, and oops, by the way, as you develop these more robust uh, controls, keep in mind that if anybody circumvents them, they can be criminally prosecuted. Keep in mind that if anybody fails to uh, implement uh, an appropriate system uh, that we think is appropriate, they can be prosecuted or the company can be prosecuted. Um, so this is what, uh, there's a conflicting incentive on the set. On the one hand, I want to have robust controls. I want to have very specific controls. I want to have guidance and policies and procedures to follow. 
but I don't also want to set myself up to be prosecuted uh, if we don't meet those requirements. So we have these sort of what I call conflicting incentives. The 2013 COSO framework and the new control standard that every company had to transition to or should have transitioned to uh, are very interesting. There's, uh, you know, there's a lot of generalizations in this area, and you know, I'm more of a practical person, and I look for the practical solutions uh, to things. But there's some interesting ideas here that I do want to talk uh, and note uh, to everybody. Uh, I'm not going to turn this into a COSO webinar because that's the surest way to fall asleep, I can promise you. If you ever have insomnia problems, start reading all the COSO material. Uh, but the the one, there are a couple principles that come out of some of the COSO documents and the framework that we all should be mindful of. That is that internal controls, just like I said, include, include compliance. And internal controls means more than just accounting controls, but it extends to compliance policies, procedures, auditing, monitoring, control activities, communication, everything for that. And, more, and, and most importantly, the responsibility for effective controls, uh, there's a statement in the framework, resides with everyone in the company. And that's, uh, and that's an important principle. And you can rest assured that SEC and DOJ are going to cite that at some point or refer to it. The five main core concepts have remained the same, uh, and that being your control environment, you know, ethics and integrity and other things, your risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and your monitoring activity. What's new is the 17 separate principles uh, that go along with this, okay? And uh, what I've done here, and I've taken this actually from Tom Fox, if you, uh, I could have had a hard time trying to put this together. But, um, and they're broken out, the 17 principles apply to each of the five core areas. And this is very, very important. I mean, I think it's worth looking at the 17 principles uh, and getting involved in this, and that's one of my messages to compliance people, is that they have to start to get a little bit more involved in the controls and the fashioning of the controls. It's usually, you know, the CFO and the financial people put together these things and they watch over them, you control or your internal auditor. But I do think uh, there's a place here now for and a reason for compliance to get more uh, involved. Anyway, these are the 17 principles uh, uh, and there are good uh, sample questionnaires out there to go through these. But nonetheless, in terms of the principles and trying to sort of map your organization against these 17 principles and questions that can be used to, to do that. One of the most important one I want to talk about is number eight. In the risk assessment area, it says assesses fraud risk. And it actually, when you look at the language, it's broader than that. It's fraud and corruption. And for that reason, bribery now is on the table as part of an internal controls requirement. So there has to be a risk assessment that's done. And obviously there's the fraud risk includes bribery, uh, but they, they, they basically said fraud and corruption risk, and that means bribery. So number eight is very important in terms of anti-corruption compliance, and if you're the chief compliance officer, it's something that you have to specifically uh, be involved in or take responsibility for uh, with the financial folks uh, when you get to these types of things. Uh, and, um, and then we have our control activities, which I think obviously are very important for uh, the chief compliance officers. The control environments of the top five are obviously very important. That's your culture of compliance. That's your integrity, what the board does, what the management is doing. Uh, with regard to that. What is interesting is it doesn't extend to culture down in a sort of a tone at the top type of checklist. And it's not necessarily um, uh, extending down into middle or uh, lower sort of operate, level operations at the tone that is there. Whereas I believe that, that there is a requirement or I think encourage people to make sure that the tone of your company is permeating the rest of the company. So an effective system of internal controls, uh, and I love how, uh, I love accounts uh, and auditors 
but each of the five components is present and functioning. And uh, those five that we just talked about. And the five, present and functioning means if the relevant principle is determined to be present and functioning, and the relevant principle is present and functioning, if there's persuasive evidence that the uh, controls are selected, developed, and deployed to affect them. Uh, so each has to be operating themselves, and then also the five components have to operate together in an integrated uh, fashion, and they have the way to break that out, that they're present and functioning, each of the five, and that, uh, I mean, the big issue is really, are there deficiencies across all of the principles or the, of the five components that ag when they're aggregated, they result in a determination uh, that of a material weakness. And that's what auditors, I guess, are going to be doing in their sense uh, using, uh, and it's really not that much different than the 92 framework in that term. Um, so my point, uh, hopefully, that's come across here is that the DOJ and SEC risk of accounting controls enforcement absolutely has increased. Companies face conflicting incentives. Companies face uh, even more, um, and, you know, I think complexities now with the transition to the COSO framework with 17 principles and a much more complicated set of a matrix for internal controls. And uh, remember internal controls, obviously, whenever you try to get involved in it, and if the financial folks say, well, what are you getting involved in? You have nothing to do with this. You're compliant. No, no, no. Compliance is part of our internal controls if we work together. Uh, you get a seat at the table as well. And so what I would urge people to do in the compliance profession is to take a little bit more time to get involved in the internal controls issue. Um, it's one thing to go around and talk about, and I think it's really important to understand how people get access to money for improper purposes like bribery and things like that. It's one thing to go around and say we have an anti-corruption and compliance policy and people aren't supposed to do this and here are all our policies, here's how we train people, here's how we inform people, and here's how we enforce this policy if we get allegations of wrongdoing. But I think there, the next step has to occur, which is I would like the compliance person to be aware of and be involved in the design of the internal controls and the design of uh, access to money, taking into account the risks that they see for bribery, kickbacks, whatever. Uh, and that, to me, it has, the, the chief compliance officer uh, has to be a part of this equation and has to be part uh, at the table with the financial people talking about this. Um, I don't see as much coordination. I always see coordination between the chief compliance officer and the internal auditor. But what I'm talking about is what are our controls that are in place? How do our authorizations work? Uh, what approvals are needed? Uh, yes, we have approvals that are required for gifts, meals, and entertainment, but I'm talking about just even expenditures of money, uh, you know, for getting access to paying our third parties. What process do we have in place to review invoices from third parties to make sure that we are following our contracts to make sure there's a description of services? All those are uh, important uh, uh, principles. Um, and so I, what I want to say is, um, uh, um, what I want to say is that the chief compliance officer has to step up to take this sort of new responsibility. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, if there are any questions, I do have a little bit of time uh, to, to uh, address those. Uh, another plug for the Volkoff Law Firm, uh, we've been doing uh, sanctions work, anti-corruption compliance, uh, general enforcement defense, internal investigations. One issue I'm absolutely very concerned about are risk assessments and compliance program assessments. Uh, I'm seeing more interest in that concept from people in terms of how whatever we have built, is it built well? Are there ways to, that we can enhance the program? Uh, where do you think we are on the map these days? Uh, and how can we benchmark our services? So uh, that's something we uh, are helping uh, a lot of people with these days. 
Um, another question came in, and that is, uh, and actually came in much earlier, and that is, um, uh, does the auditor ever have an obligation to report to the DOJ any findings on issues that may suggest bribery? Uh, in other words, and that raises a very interesting question. There are obviously lawyers are not required to um, to report things, but an auditor, if they do see uh, potential, uh, you know, if they do see corruption uh, or mis, uh, you know misconduct, they're required. Obviously, to, they the only time they ever go to a government, the government, and there was one case where that occurred, uh, one investigation is when uh, management does not resolve or re re, you know, respond adequately to the issue. They do have uh, a requirement, a professional requirement to report it at some point, but there are several steps that they have to go through before they get to that. In one case, that led to an auditor actually going to the Justice Department uh, and the FTC. Uh, so that's a, a very good question. Uh, okay, um, if the controls are uh, simply ineffective, just following them, which doesn't prevent bribery, mean that the FCPA's internal controls requirements are met. Um, I don't think so. Uh, if the controls are ineffective uh, in following them, I think you have to, the general requirement is to devise a system that is, you know, reasonably effective, uh, that is the reasonable language, uh, reasonably effective in this situation. Um, and if it doesn't uh, prevent the bribery, uh, it doesn't by definition mean they were ineffective uh, in that sense. Um, but if they are ineffective and following them, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that that meets the internal controls requirement. I think the government makes the argument, hey, if they didn't work, then they obviously were ineffective, which is not a fair comment, but I've seen it. Uh, I've heard them say that. That's true. That is for sure. Um, one question that came in is, what can a CCO do to prevent fraud in the FCPA context? Well, to me, the most important thing is, I always say, you got obviously you rely on so many aspects of your program, but look where your money is. How do you get access to money? And uh, for example, I, I've done a webinar on China where, you know, my question to China was. You know, you don't put somebody in there, a local person running the money uh, without uh, sufficient checks. And I've even argued to use expats because there's so many personal connections that people have uh, and ways to defraud the system with receipts and other things, fake receipts and things like that. Okay. Uh, well, thank you again. Appreciate it. Uh, again, send me an email. I'll be happy to send you the slides. Stay in touch, and uh, we're happy to help on any type of projects we can. And um, uh, and please follow the blog, uh, and uh, we'll have this up on the YouTube channel. Thank you again, and uh, have a great great day. Bye.